Can we still say good morning? Good morning. Good morning. Great. So um, it was a really exciting morning today listening to both Jim Shelton and Martha Cantor. And I'm going to whisk through some of the fir first slides that I've prepared, but because I know you folks are an audience that really gets this. Um, just a brief introduction of who we are to set the context. Um, Open Study, that is the company I'm going to talk about, is a, is a small startup that was funded, that was started by um, two educators, myself. Um, I'm the Dean for Science, a chemist actually by training um, at Emory University, and um, my husband Ashwin, who's in computer science and cognitive science at Georgia Tech. And it's one of those things, I come home groaning and moaning about teaching, and then he says, Technology is the answer, so that's kind of how um, Open Study got created. Our third co-founder was a student um, at Stanford, and he came and did his master's with uh, Ashwin. So we're all—it's all a all family kind of a thing right now. Um, so that's who we are, and I'll talk a little bit more about how we were funded when the slide comes. So the problem that we set out to address, which is very familiar to people in this audience, is one of access. You're never going to have enough universities, bricks and mortar, to satisfy the needs of the millions of young people that are looking for education. So that's a really large problem, and I'm so glad that we have in the room and at conferences like this, people such as yourselves that are creating the content. And we're talking now about the long tail of education you have at the head, the MITs for real, and the Yales and the Harvards, and at the tail you have the OCW providers, but also in this group, you have the Khan Academies, who are doing really well, our neighbors in Mountain View, um, the iTunes and all these folks that are now really challenging education and disrupting it in a, in a fundamental way. Really happy this problem is being addressed. The problem that we're looking at is one of the learning experience. And as educators in the room, you all know, no matter how good your textbook, it's never good enough. I can't think of a single engineer who read 15 textbooks and managed to go build a bridge just on that. So you are going to need help. You are going to need interaction, engagement, and then the problem of retention, which again Martha Cantor talked about today. This is where we are at. How can we construct that wonderful learning experience so that while you folks create the online universities and charter schools and online content, your students stay engaged, retained, motivated and succeed in graduating. So this is a no-brainer for anyone. Ask yourself, what are they doing now? What engages them? Hands? What, what, are they do? what are your students, your digital millennials engaged in? 24-7 sometimes. Absolutely. So there is a whole world of digital things out there. So as educators, we know where they're spending their time. And we know it's not only learning. So that's one thing. This is the other one, which has come into a lot of attention thanks to President Obama's own quote. We know they're spending a lot of time on games. So how can we then address this challenge? How do we take the knowledge that we have that this is what motivates our kids, this is what keeps them engaged, this is where they're really fired up and passionate about, but then move them to a learning environment? And so that's the challenge that we set out to, to address. And so. The answer for us was very simple. It has to be something that they can relate to, something that looks and feels like a World of Warcraft, that looks and feels like a Facebook, maybe even Twitter, something that they feel comfortable with because these are digital natives. I mean, these people have grown up thinking Facebook and thinking I am's and they they have a different um, you know family <coughs> of thumbs I believe because I can't do what my daughter does on that. So how do we do that? Our answer was open study. Um, open study, so there's my funding page. It grew out of research that I was doing with my husband and um, Chris Bray on collaborative learning environments, problem based learning. And what we noticed was what was really addictive for these kids was the ability to get together and collaborate with one another online. I mean, you could put them in, this, in the room, but they'd rather talk to each other online. <laughs> Great, you know, that was a wonderful lesson learned. And so we took all we had from that research, and our program officer at that time said, go create a startup, a, a dot com, and we'll fund you through SBIR funding. So NSF, wonderful people, have funded us for two rounds, NIH, Georgia Research Alliance, so, and that's because our, our work is really 
based on a lot of research, which I don't have on the slide here because I want to talk to you about the learning experience. Okay, I hope you heard my plug for OCW this morning because what we do is the study groups we create wrap around content. We are content agnostic. Anybody that has any kind of content, whether it's OCW or OER, can access the learning community that we built. And the learning community of students and some older folks as well is focused on study. So the minute you log on to Open Study, you will see um, topics. So you know right off, it's not about the bar you went to or the girl you're dating, but it's math, physics, computer science, and things like that. We are pretty STEM heavy because of our funding. Um, and then you'll also see right off the bat how many people are there. And this is really important for them because they want to go where the party is. They want to know that there's people out there that can help them or they can chat with. Um, and how do we integrate? So here's your um, MIT OCW site. And when we went to MIT OCW, you know, they get, right now I think they're getting nine, 12 million, is Kate in the room anywhere? They get 12 million um, um, hits, and their most popular course is MIT 6.0 Intro to CS figures. So they have, oh, I think about 40,000 people a month in there, but if you were taking the MIT 6.0 course by yourself, and you had a question, the fact that there are 40,000 people also taking it with you is totally useless. Because if you raised your hand and said, I really want help with assignment 4.0, and here's this question I can't understand, who will you ask? So when we went to MIT and said, we'll build that community around so that when you ask a question, there'll be someone to answer it. That's what sold it. So we integrate with our partners in the manner. So there's that little get live help button you see with a little owl. That's us. It gives a live feed of the questions that are being asked right there in that particular study group. Once again, it's one of those things our students want to see. They want to see action. So that's the action. And while you're there, you can click right into it, and that will then take you into Open Study. And for our partners, it's actually a good win-win situation because now whatever happens on our site, and you'll see that in a minute, is on our site. It's not on an open, it's not on MIT site, so there's a little little separation of we are MIT and here's Open Study, which is a resource we provide. So what does it actually look like when you go into Open Study? This is just the feed. Um, we have partners with all over people here in the U.S. and across um, the world, and we also partner with OCW and OER folks that are people that are just creating content. So. This is what we call open social learning. Um, it's open in the sense anybody, anytime, anywhere, any institution can get online. It's free, thanks to our funding from the various organizations, and, and most recently Gates and Hewlett. Um, and it's learning. It is about learning. The questions are about learning. The, the discussions are about learning. So when you look at this, for example, there's questions being asked on the, the left. And on the right are, are a stream of groups that you could belong to. I have, I'm currently belonging to the MIT 6.0 chemistry and a couple of others, and it's shown at the bottom. And you can see for every group you belong to, you can see who's there. The large squares are people that have been contributing a lot. It's like a leaderboard. And that's a very, you know, very seductive concept for these folks. People are incentivized to grow from the little squares to the big little rectangles to the big rectangles because now they're the leaderboard. You also see little numbers and you also, if you mouse over them, you'll see little interesting pieces of information like um, what a little profile, what, are they, what groups are they following, um, how many levels have they achieved, how many badges and things like that. And I'll come to that in just a second. Um, the green bars in the bottom are our chats. So these are off-topic chats usually. While the on-topic chats are here and they're really um, very focused, off-topic chats can be anything. And that's kind of a, a, a social release. And there's all kinds of exciting things going in there. They're 15 to 24 year olds. You can figure out what kind of chats they're going to have. And I'll talk about moderators in a minute. But the other thing that we have is these chats, for example, light up when someone's there. So while you're sitting there and you're answering a question about, I don't know, intro to Python, and you see this little thing turn green to yellow, 
Um, you go right there to see what's happening. So we again, we, we, we flesh out this notion of, of immediacy and presence and the fact that while you're studying, you can also chat, but stay here because there's more studying to be done. So I just posted a question at some point, so I could take a screenshot for you folks on, um, on Python, what, can I, what textbook can I use? And right off the bat, three people came to answer that question, and we see that a lot. And we also see that there's this person who's actually answered, and right below him is someone that's in the process of answering. So if it was, if it was one of your learners, and they had a, a, a question there that they were asking, they would then stick around to see what was being said. Of course, they might get distracted, but they certainly come back to see what was being said. And the value of this is that it's not a, a post and pray sort of a scenario, where you post a question, you have to come back tomorrow and see if there's an answer. There's a just-in-time kind of a help. And second, it's not just um, which of the following is true. Is it a yes or no kind of a thing where you get an answer and you go away? There's a dialogue. The, because there's people in there, we get this give and take, and quite often you get a wrong answer, then the next guy will come along and say, by the way, I think this is not right, and then the next guy will respond. And you get a real rich dialogue, and we think that conversation is very, very important. And even if there's a wrong answer, as an educator, we believe there's a value to having that conversation, because the longer you spend thinking about these things, articulating your ideas, evaluating it if it's right or wrong, the greater gains for learning. So we're really excited that, that, that we get multiple people going right in. In fact, we sort of laughingly call this the piranha effect. So I want to post a question. People dive in, you know, I want to be able to answer that because of our reward system. So what does our reward system look like? We really worked hard on a couple of things. The first is we know that kids want just-in-time help. So let's provide that by building the community and having enough people in there so you come to ask for help. But the second part of it is we want them to stay and stick around and engage and then we want to incent them with the right rewards for the right behavior. So our game-like mechanisms allows us to do that. Um, if you are in World of Warcraft, how many of you have kids or who have, why should I say kids? How many of you have um, encountered World of Warcraft? either by paying for it or having kids that do this. But you know that when you're in there, it's actually a pretty good system. Um, and when you're in there, you are you know, uh, in quests together, you look for trophies, you do things, and you socialize. Well, our team that's built this is a very young World of Warcraft sort of a team, so they've built some of those ideas. And you'll see you get medals for helpfulness, you get rewards for answering questions, but you also get rewards for asking questions because it's really important to articulate a question. And then you get rewards for um, by your peer, by being recognized as a generally good person, by accumulating fans. A fan is the highest compliment your uh, peer group can give you because you can only become a fan once. Um, so we really worked hard on building the kinds of rewards so that we can get the kind of behavior that we would want to see in our young people. And, and that's some of the gamification. They've got good feedback. One day, just when I was bored and I had nothing to do, I went and I counted the number of times people had used the word addictive. It was 82 times when it had been used in, you know, in their last, I don't know, a couple of weeks or so. And that's exciting. Can you imagine a kid going back and saying, I found a math flight exciting or addictive? I think that's mind-blowing. To me, I teach chemistry to freshmen year after year, and, and to get that kind of, uh, you know, the kind of engagement with a topic, I think is a great win. So there we are. Um, this is our global community. Um, again, following on what Martha said, I changed my slide to say, we're building world peace, because we have 70,000 people from 170 countries that are getting together, talking about stuff in a meaningful way. If they don't behave, they get kicked out by the moderators. So they have to behave, they learn to behave. Um, we get 180,000 uniques per month, average users, 100 um, users online every now and then, and we get a, and, and I know someone will ask this. Of the questions that are asked, about 80% of them get answered. 70% are actually answered within five minutes, so it gives you that just-in-time feel. 
Um, we go back and keep asking our users with surveys, how is it, why are you doing what you're doing? So we know all kinds of cute things. Um, the one that I like is 84% agree that open study is fun. And why is that important to us? We think it should be fun so that they can keep coming back. We can lay on the learning, but if it's not fun and if they're not there, you can't do anything. 70% um, of them also said that they get the help they want, which is good, which means they'll keep coming back. Um, and of course, they'll recommend it to their friends. We also listen to them and we ask them, what are you looking for? And some of them want to, and I'll be asked them, are you coming here for homework? Because, you know, that's a big thing. Are they cheating on their homework? Um, it turns out that a bunch of them are more, more than the homework group. There are people that are coming because they're on online courses. This is what we had predicted. And also people that are using it to learn better or have a deeper understanding. And then this is the part, this is the one question I, I was, I said, oh, interesting. So we asked them, do you want to connect with people you know? Or people you don't know. Now, do you like to find other people from your class and this and that? And 36% of them said, they really want to connect with people you don't know. So go figure. This is that generation that's bold and out there and really wants to grow their social circle in what we would think in a very high-risk way, but, but it's great. So that's the value prop we bring to them. Just in time, fun and engaging, game-like, and it helps them grow their, their, their peer group. Um, I've got stuff about demographics, as you'd expect, most of them are male. 60% um, of them are full-time students, and 70% of them are from the U.S. So we've got the engagement, we've got the, um, we've got interaction, and the next thing we're looking at now is um, retention. And this is in the environment, the ecosystem right now. Arnie Duncan, I know P2PU, and, and Mozilla Foundation. And we went back and talked to the teachers and our students, and when we talked to some of our OCW learners that are on our site, we actually found that 44% of them said they would love some kind of recognition for the amount of time they're spending in there. So we're working on um, badges or certificates, whatever it's going to be um, called, we don't know yet. But the idea would be, here are people that are spending months on our system, demonstrating to us that they are helpful, that they are articulate, that they can um, demonstrate subject matter expertise. How can we find a way to recognize that and the, their engagement with the community as well as with the topic? Whatever form this is going to take, it will be a joint initiative with our OCW and OER partners and ourselves. So if you're interested in talking to me about that, I'd love for us to do that. Um, and I wanted to leave plenty of time for questions because I know this is always ready for questions. So. I thank you for your time. Yes. Uh, you said that your um, subject matter is mostly STEM based or, you know, science, math. Uh, but do, does your site support mathematical notation? Yes. Or, and how does it? Can you talk about that a little bit? Yes, yes. We um, have a screenshot of that. But yeah, we've got a LaTeX. Le style um, equation editor that's inside, so when you, you know, I can't see that there. But, in, but if you go down there, it, it allows you to do, absolutely, and uh, it put in equations of the, whatever you want, of fancy you want to do, so yeah, absolutely. And we, while we're focused on STEM, we have writing, for example, we're partnered with Produce um, Online Writing Lab, we have arts, um, we are partnered with Process Arts, which is in the UK, so we do have that. But the bulk of our, what's really hard is math for most people, so we get a lot of um, usage from there. I think there was a, yes? I mean, this is uh, really exciting. I had no idea about it. I'm curious, I mean, you have such a large user base. It seems like people are finding it. How do you go, how did you make that happen? That's a huge... Um, a partnerships. Well, you know, we get 30% of our um, traffic from partnerships, so people go to MIT and say, oh, I want to see this, this particular aspect of Python, and then they see our link and they come to us. 30% um, of it just comes from Google searches, because each and every question that's ever asked, and I can address this, is archived, 
and it's searchable. So when you go to Google and you, you ask, say, um, you know, what's Taylor series or something like that, and Open Study will be one of the hits. So we get 30% of our traffic just for that, without doing anything fancy for SEO or anything mm -hmm. like that. And then um, the rest of it comes from things like stumble upon or people just knowing word of mouth. So 60% comes from these two sources. Um, yes. You said that this is uh, content like diagnostics. Yes. Is it actually possible for somebody else to take their content and place it inside your system or language? Right. Right. Absolutely. So, so, when if you wish to partner with us. Um, what we would do is we would just give you a JavaScript and which actually there's a self-service page if you go to our website and see a partner with us. It's three lines of code and when you put that in your HTML um, pages then that pops up this widget and it links it to the right study group, the topic study group in OpenStudy. So it's a self-service. Yeah. And then who does the, you mentioned moderation, so who does that now for Good, I'm glad you asked. So moderation is very important for us because of the age group. I, I, I show you the demographics. What we decided to do was, if you were to really scale, we can't hire moderators enough, or, or teachers for that matter. So we select people from the community. These are people in the community who've proven themselves as subject matter experts over time, and who also have proven themselves to have the right attributes of personality and, and everything so that they can be chosen. And then we train them and we ask them, you know, would you like to do this? So they are allowed, and because we go, it's a very <coughs> group, um, we have moderators 24-7 from different countries, and they have the ability to do two very important things. One is to remove, delete inaccurate content, and also inappropriate content. So they're probably around. But more than that, you know, when you build a good community, you know it's successful when the community itself reaches out and says, this is wrong, you shouldn't be doing this. So along with the moderators, we now have a very strong sense of what's right and what's not right on the system. And, um, and it's marvelous. So, so we do have moderators, but the community is, is doing it themselves. Yes? I have kind of a, a two-part question. My first is, is kind of a question about the cheating that you mentioned in format and moderation. I, I love the like uh, user interface on Open Study, and when I logged on, I found it very addictive. But I, I got really frustrated right away because it seemed to me like all the questions that I saw initially, it just it just screamed cheating to me. It's, it seemed like people asking for you know answers to their homework. Um, and so I guess I'm curious like how you deal with that, and if you've tweaked the format at all. Um, around that or, or kind of what the progression around that is. So I'm going to have to go back and ask, just because it's homework, is it cheating? Uh, I mean... I don't know that. that. If, it, if, it, if it's someone asking a question, getting someone else to do the work for them, and then representing it as their own, that's... Okay, important. so we are, we know, we're both educators, we're in good institutions, so we have academic integrity um, uh, built into our terms of agreement. If, for any reason, it really is cheating. A um, couple of things happen. As I said, the community itself and will, will come and report it to us. If it goes beyond that and, and an instructor has some doubt that it is cheating, then they come to us. Um, our strongest or our strength is in the fact that everything is archived and everything is transparent. Should there be any doubt in your mind, if you go to an individual's um, site, you can see all their questions, all their answers, and there's no, they can't delete it. So, so that's, it, anyone, anytime can go and see that. So we believe that's our, our strength and we approach it that way. Over and above that, um, different institutions have different policies on academic integrity and we wouldn't really be able to police it for everybody. But we take it very seriously, and if the community or a moderator or a teacher were to come and report this to us, we would take that. But go back and think about my first question, I mean, just because it's... I think it makes a lot of sense, because I, th I think you could easily say back to me, well, people could do that offline and no one would know. Absolutely. Um, so, and I know there's a tool, there's a way to misuse it. So. Um, and can I oh, just, sorry. the second okay. part of my question was, if you have any plans, especially along with the plan to look at outcomes around like how people who are participating in the study groups, like if the participation in the 
um, in the courses that they're in changes, or if they're, you know, if they're um, absolutely. Like we have great plans. This is uh, we are funded by the Gates and Hewlett Foundation, and. The challenge in devising a gold standard study, as you'll all appreciate and sympathize with me, is that we don't work with teachers in that sense. So we have 70,000 students and 16,000 schools. So while we'd love to do this gold standard where, and, and any, any uh, volunteers to work with me on this, we'd, we'd love that, where we'd ideally like to take um, a, a cohort on a, say, an online course with open study and without open study, run the experiment through. So it's been a challenge um, coming up with that. But over and above that, what we can do is, is do like a living lab study. And when we ask them, um, how many of you can report, and this is self-reported learning gains, which Elaine Seymour has been um, you know, a proponent of, how many of you have experienced a learning, an improved learning outcome or a learning gain? So we have our numbers that say, um, where was it, somewhere, 68 percent of them actually report an improvement in their learning gains. And that's pretty good, you know. This is a study that, that, that Georgia Tech does for us on our, with our students as an experiment. So any of you educators that want to do any experiments and, you know, our data is freely available and we work with all kinds of institutions for that. I think I've got the one minute, so a really quick minute, I'll take the lady in the front. Yeah. Have you considered having like an ask it? A TA, like a teacher's assistant, or ask a teacher thing if like a question can't get answered? If a question can't get answered. Or does it get answered? Maybe the student, you know, for those 20% of questions or, that you say don't get answered. Um, I think it's an interesting idea. If we, if we would probably call them something different, but yeah, I think we could certainly um, work on that where to go directly to an expert. Is what you're what you're saying? Right. Yeah, I think that would. We're, yeah, but we do. <coughs> That's a great idea, and we haven't thought of that. But thank you. We could certainly do that. I have a minimal fee. <laughs> <laughs> it's a free service, but we can talk. <laughs> well, thank you so much for all the.